welcome to episode number six of Mr. Rubio Used to Run, the Running Warehouse Podcast. I'm Joe Rubio. This is Connor. Joe, you always come in hot with the, <laughs> just a fantastic exactly. intro. Uh, hey, we're at the running event here in Austin, Texas. It's the capital of Texas, the only blue spot in the state, I believe. I mean, look, this is the biggest week of the year for running shoes right here. We're in the mix of it, and we brought a big guest for the biggest week. We got Keith Kelly. I used to also run. <laughs> so me and you, Joe, are in the same boat. Exactly. We're the same team. Yeah, it's so, great to be here. Keith, what is your job title at New Balance? I am director of specialty sales. Okay, and what does that entail? So basically any running specialty store and some like REI, for example, as a, as a, as a bigger chain, yeah. they, they fall under, under my, my remit. Okay. And I have three regional managers and a Fleet Feet specific brand manager that are direct reports. And underneath that, we have 22 account managers spread throughout the whole country, okay. including one that calls on you guys' accounts. Okay. And then um, just so that people understand, there's different uh, channels, right? There's Correct. run specialty yep. channels. What are the other channels that New Balance sells through? Yeah, so I, I roll under uh, Peter Zappala's team, which is essentially a whole, all wholesalers that are independent. Okay. So regional athletic specialty, all other specialty, uh, family shoe stores, military, for example, and running specialty. And then we have basically performance sport, which would be your DSGs, Dicks. Academy, Hibbets, those. And then you have your global key accounts, which would be Foot Locker and JD. Okay. And then you have the next kind of step down, which would be moderates and shoe chains. So the shoes that are $49.99, a lot of right. foot coverings, but a really good business uh, for New Balance. Okay. And yeah. then we have our licensed stores, obviously. Right. And how did you start? I mean, at, at a college, you went to work for Reebok? Correct. So... When the writing was on the wall very early that I wasn't going to be able to run anymore, uh -huh. I decided to go back to grad school and I did some coaching with Ray Tracy at Providence for a while. And uh, yeah, it just an opportunity opened up to, to get into the running sales team at Reebok at the time or relaunching one of their many relaunches in, in running yeah, over the years. Multiple but relaunches. this was a this was a big relaunch in about 2005. They came out with a shoe called the Trinity KFS, and and they, they put a, a lot of a lot of uh, money behind relaunching it, and they brought in a stable of athletes and hired people to run sports marketing to get a lot of athletes and sign big events. So during that period of 2005 to 2007, or re, maybe even into 2008, Reebok really had a lot of great runners on the roster, and had a lot of great events: road races, cross country races, indoor track meet in Boston. So it was just a happening vibe, but the product wasn't quite there. But I, I learned a ton uh, working in sales and marketing there with Kevin Adams and Lee Cox. And uh, it yeah, was Ted, Ted was there too, right? Yeah, Ted was there, Ted Fitzpatrick. And uh, they were, it was just amazing. And Ted's obviously VP of footwear now at, at Saucony and, and, and Lee works in the Deckers org. I learned a ton from those lads and uh, just, yeah, got, got my head kicked in as well yeah. because the shoes weren't great. But I think the retailers appreciated the hustle and the effort and the fact that we were very passionate about the sport. And we cared, like we cared more than some of the brands that were doing a lot of volume. So that kind of helped us get along. And then when we all went in our separate directions to other companies, the experience at Reebok is what kind of stood, stood to us. And it helped me a, a ton when I got to New Balance. Yeah, how'd you get in the door at New Balance? Uh, serendipitous timing. <laughs> uh, I had met Tom Carlio in New York. I had met him before that, just on the, on the circuit of being in, in running specialty stores. But I really met him in New York the day that Ryan Shea passed away at the Olympic marathon trials in 2007, the trials for the 2008 Olympics. And uh, we had a funny moment together in Rosie O'Grady's. RIP Rosie O'Grady's, <laughs> not there anymore. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, we, we met each other and we had a, a moment that night and you know Tom was obviously with with Saucony at that time and and he was you know close with Ryan and I knew Ryan as well from the Big East we were rivals in the Big East so it was a bit of a just a very surreal time because we were also celebrating Brian Sell making the team and the Brooks team was there and and like it was a, such a big day for them so it was just a surreal moment and uh, I got to know Tom and then a few years later 
I decided that I didn't, Reebok had divested from running and had moved into CrossFit and pivoted into the CrossFit world. And it just wasn't me, you know, I wasn't, I'm not cut from that cloth, I'm an endurance guy. So I was just like, you know what, I've given it my best. I'm gonna hang it up and head back to Europe. So I, I, I quit Reebok essentially and was just kind of living out the last 90 days I had on my visa when someone at New Balance in the running team and marketing quit her job and Kevin Adams and a few phone calls later and Tom remembered me and boom, got hired before I went home, saved the visa and that was 12 years ago and I've been there since. That's fantastic. Yep. Now, Carl, what, one of the benefits that I hear that I'm hearing from the Reebok side was how great the culture was. And I think probably that transition to New Balance, you not only have the culture, but now you finally have good products. Yeah, and, and, you know, and a long range plan, yeah. right? So Reebok was at that time, yeah, they were, they were all in on sport. They were almost at, ahead of, the spending was ahead of where the products were. I mean, like when they were getting into something, they went all in. So, they got back into soccer at the time, football. So they were signing Thierry Henry and Andrei Shevchenko and these world-class strikers. But I, I don't know if the boots were exactly where they needed to be. So there was good, always good energy. But you just always were waiting for it to kind of not work out. And uh, it was unfortunate that it didn't. But you get the same culture over at New Balance. And, but running was, you know, New Balance is much bigger now. But then it was all about running. And then the pillar of running has kind of stayed in New Balance as the, the company's gotten more horizontal and added new sports and obviously the lifestyle side of the business is on fire. Running's kind of the center pillar. You know, they, the old running shoes are now lifestyle shoes and it just kind of s cycles back around and yet that culture still remains from the top down. So it's awesome. Carlio is a very funny man. Yes, yes. You he get a lot funny. of energy. Yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> one time we had this meeting and we were at the headquarters and uh, Jason Lewis had this gigantic PowerPoint presentation and Carlio gets about two thirds of the way through it. He goes, Joe, how do you feel about New Balance? I said, I'm good with New Balance. I said, how do you feel about running warehouse? He goes, I'm good. We got up and we went down the street to this <laughs> honky tonk bar. Bukowski's probably or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that, yeah, that's very, that's very Tom. <laughs> that, we like that style, which is why when we do vendor, meetings yeah we try to keep the the presentations to a minimum and the fun to the maximum yes exactly and because we want we want everyone to know we're very serious and we we're, we have solutions to how we can partner and be better partners but we want you to know that like we're good people on both sides and good people jive together and then with good product and all those pieces come together the magic happens yeah. so where are you from i'm from a town called drogheda in county Louth which is about 50K north of Dublin, between Dublin and Belfast in the northeast of Ireland. Okay, and how did yeah. you start running? So when I was really, really young, a running club started in my, basically in my neighborhood. So it was the traditional grassroots story. A running club starts, volunteers get the kids together and say, we're gonna keep you out of trouble. You're coming running on Tuesdays and Thursdays and the weekend. And I fell in love with it and I was good at it. You know, bare feet running, didn't do anything for my form, made my form worse probably, but I still, I still loved it. And uh, yeah, we, were, we didn't have tracks, so we did everything on grass. And we were all good cross country runners. And then I just stuck with it. And then fortunately, by the time I got to secondary school, which is high school here, the PE teacher, Eamon Ryan, was, uh, he was just really, really good, really, really good to us. And he recognized that running was a sport that could bring a lot of different kids together and keep us out of trouble so he because we trained after school every day and i just yeah it just got better and better and by the time i turned about 16 i knew i was good so i got a national junior championship when i was one year young so the equivalent of being a junior in high school winning the national champs i did that and then won again my senior year and then had, had a bunch of college offers and then so i got to the states <laughs> Now, me and you have a little bit in common because I'm also a stronger cross-country runner on the track. Not the best form, but like the grit is there. And yeah. you know, you can almost, you can kind of beat out people just through wearing them down. Did you know pretty early on that cross-country was your calling and track was something maybe you didn't look forward 100%. to? 100%. <laughs> and I agree with what you're saying. Super shoes, 
not really beneficial in a proper cross country course. Right. And running form, you don't want to actually be very bouncy on a cross country course. You want to be kind of low to the ground and you want to, you want to, yeah, you want to be a mudder, right? Yeah. And we grew up in mud cross country. So we didn't have a track. So when we got to go to the track for like a, the Leinster championships or for the all Ireland championships, it was, I didn't know what to, I didn't know how to run on a track and that, carried all the way through. I, I didn't run fast times. I ran 8.30 for 3K, but my cross-country equivalent, the lads I was beating on cross-country were running 8.15 for 3K, but I couldn't beat them on the track. So I knew in college that I had to focus on cross-country each season. And uh, all four seasons, I had one, one bad NCs, and then I was 14th, 9th, and 1st in three NCs. But, you know, even though I got third on the track in the 5K, and ran okay. I, it just never, I was always hurt. Body never felt right. And then once I got to July and I could just focus on running on grass and running on the, the roads, I felt amazing. In cross country here in America and specifically California, you look at stuff, Mount Sac, these are almost glorified road races. What do you consider a true cross country course? What's, what's some of the so toughest the, elements you face? Well, in the US, the, the tough, I think the purest cross country course, apart from when it's raining, yeah was probably Rimrock Farm in Kansas, which is, if you've ever read the book Running with the Buffaloes, that Adam Gaucho won that day, and that was a really tough course. Really steep hills and lots of lots I think of this Bob Timmons was Jim Ryan's coach. That was his... Did he design that yeah. course? There's a statue of Jim Ryan. On yeah, the, so or, it was... A yeah. cut out of Jim Ryan on right. the course, and Billy Mills as well. And right. It was called the Billy Mills Ascent. Yeah. And it was brutal. Like, it was a pure wall, and then... You know, the surface is cinders, but the old school Van Cortland Park, when you go into the backwoods and it was constantly rolling and then you had to go up over Cemetery Hill, yep. like that's real. That's, that's where the track runners struggle, right? But yeah, some, I, I get frustrated with these cross-country courses that are designed to make sure you don't get hurt and like all this, you know, check the box that they, there's a long finishing straight that, you know, what you want is European style cross country, which is where if you're a good cross country runner, you have the advantage over a track runner. So track runners have the advantage all indoor and all outdoor, and they have the advantage with the Olympics and the world championships and all of these things. Cross country doesn't have, have that much light, you know, time to shine. So I prefer to see courses that are sloppy, softer, European style, yeah. you know, where, where you just, you're just you running in mud and you, if you're a good track runner, you're going to really struggle. Yeah. And someone who's a strong cross-country runner. And some people can do both. Like Chris Stelinski could do both, yeah. you know. Uh, Dathan Ritzenheim could do both. There's lots of runners. Kim Smith could do both. I couldn't do both. I could do <laughs> just cross-country. <laughs> so on the cross-country side, I mean, five-time All-American, national champion, yeah. you know, top 25 at Worlds. You've got all you check all the boxes for a successful cross-country runner but i know you maybe didn't hit quite what you were hoping for and part of that had to do with injuries oh yes yeah, all the injuries how often were you injured every every season outdoor yeah and then after college permanently injured and what was the most common injury so it's it started with just stress fractures and then I went into hip and, and pelvic stress fractures. And then I had a sacrum stress fracture. And the sacrum stress fracture really messed up my, my whole body to where my knees started to get really bad. I wore away the insides of my knees, had to get multiple surgeries, had six knee, knee surgeries. And now I can't run a step. But it started in 2000. Yeah, it started in outdoor 2000. And then 2001 was, was really bad. 2002 was really bad, and then 2003 was the end. That was the end. Yeah, I ran 340 for 1500, not doing too much training. And I was like, man, maybe 1500 is what I can do on the track, because it's just like hard, and I don't have to kind of do the, do, do the grind. But then I got a huge, not a huge stress fracture and yeah. nerve impingement in my back. And when I'm, I'm sure 04 uh, Olympics was probably was on the, the horizon. That I was, was psyched, yeah. but I didn't run a step in 04. Didn't really run much in 05, then came back in 09 and won the Irish National Cross Country Championships and then got a stress fracture in the race in my knee at the head of my uh, tibia wow. from just a bone on bone. Yeah. And then I, that was the last race I've ever run. Right. Packed it in. Then you started cycling, right? Yeah, I started cycling two years later. Yeah. yeah, on the advice of friends that saw me just getting like sad. Right. But your ascent in cycling was pretty amazing. 
Yeah, cycling. I was yeah, cycling. The ascent was good. I was I was good at runners make great cyclists. Uh, so I think a lot of runners could transition. Mike Woods is the most famous example right now. Mike Woods, Canadian, ran at Michigan, sub four minute mile in high school, won a Tour de France stage at 36 this past summer, and was third at the World Championships. So I just came to it late. I was 32, 33 when I started, and I had the fitness, but I didn't have the bike handling, so I crashed a lot. I still crash <laughs> a lot, but I crashed a lot back then. And um, yeah, cycling's a high barrier to entry, you know? It's a sport that, you know, is, it, there's so much etiquette compared to running that I didn't know, but I could just, I, I climbed through the ranks and I got to Cat 1 in, in a 12-month period. Wow. So when I was at Cat 1, I was racing people that were far better than me, but I was as fit as them, but I just couldn't ride with them. So I'd, I'd make stupid mistakes and lead a lot and just not, not understand drafting and conservation and f feeding and... I'd forget to eat and all of these factors play into, into cycling in a big way. So I've gotten to know that much better now, but now I'm old. So but I'm even a with that master lack, blaster. Even with that lack ex of experience on the bike, I'm sure the running competitiveness yeah. started trickling in and you know, you were, you're right up there with the top guys. It's crazy. And it's, and it's a, for someone who likes to, likes the pain, the, like yeah, the suffer, yeah. cycling is really good because you, in running, I always say in running, when, you, when you're done, you're done. There's no coming back. Like if you're dropped, you, you can't just chill out and eat a Snickers bar and drink a can of Coke <laughs> and then get back into the race. Maybe you can in a hundred miler in, yeah. in ultra running, but you certainly can't in the marathon or anything down from that. But in cycling, you can. Yeah. And this is the beauty of it. Like you're, you're on the limit. So you just sit in and stuff a few Morton gels in and, you know, keep the head down. And then suddenly you just feel the sugars and stuff get in your system and then boom, ready to go again. So you attack again. Yeah. Now, didn't you crash on your honeymoon? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my wife hates it, but uh, we were in Mallorca, which is, this was a year and a half ago. We were in Mallorca for a honeymoon, a delayed honeymoon, and because uh, of COVID. And it was awesome. And it was at the, near the end of the trip, and she drove across the island to a town called Dea. And I was going to meet her over there for a glass of wine and a jump in the ocean, and then I could get changed. So it was a four-hour ride, and at, at two miles from where I was supposed to meet her, I had a mousetrap crash going down a hill, hit some uh, diesel in the road, and shattered my femur and, and, and hip, and had pins and stuff in there now. I had a big surgery over there. So it was a disaster. So I told my wife I'd never cycle on vacation again. <laughs> wow. We'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. <laughs> So you have an interesting story, you know, going back a bit um, about your parents, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know there's different dialects of sign language. Yeah, my parents are deaf. So my brother and I are like the movie Coda. If you've seen that, that movie, we were raised by deaf parents. And uh, but yeah, they we we sign an ISL, which is different than, different than ASL. The alphabet has some crossovers with ASL. Several letters are, are the same. Several letters are obviously different, and uh, words tend to be different. But if I meet a deaf person, an American deaf person, I can communicate with them. Okay. There's universal energy in the signs, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, because at the end of the day, it's an expressive language, and most of the signs really do relate to what you're saying. So you, make, you have other mannerisms in the, the, way, you, the way you express your face, if, if you're talking about happiness, you know, you, your eyes go wide and you, you express and enjoy. So even though the words aren't the same, I can communicate. And I've, I found it really fun meeting, meeting deaf people over here and, and chatting with them, even though I don't know the sign language. I can get by the, with the alphabet, but I don't know the full signs. Right. My daughters are both fluent in American Sign Language. Yeah. Right. Evie's nieces are fluent in American Sign Language as well. And I keep saying that I'm going to learn it because I want, I want to be fluent in it. But at the, I'm at the point now where I've almost forgotten a lot of my Irish sign language because I talk to my parents on, uh, over FaceTime, but like my, my, my signing has gotten so shoddy. And it's, it's, I, I imagine it's the same as if talking to someone in like lingo. You know, it's not like the proper English. So I'm kind of doing signs that probably aren't sign language anymore, but my mom and dad know what I'm talking about. So they just <laughs> kind of go with it, you know? <laughs> Wow. Well, and I, I thought it was interesting because even with having deaf parents, they still understood the importance of having music in the house 
Yeah, and you had time. a boombox at an early age. Yeah, me and my brother, they, my parents loved it. My mom used to try and listen to music really loud on headphones to get the vibe, and then my, they can feel the pulse, you know? So they liked having the music in the house. They also, if I'm playing music and they're upstairs or something, they can feel it, and it, it was a sense of like, they can hear me, you know, mm -hmm. because they can feel it. Yeah. So yeah, I got into the DJing and everything and had the turntables in the front room. And so if you didn't end up in New Balance, maybe you could have been a DJ in maybe. another life. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that, that, that culture was crazy in the mid-90s. Yeah. So it would have taken a lot of discipline to stay in the straight and narrow. Right. But uh, yeah, maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of uh, going back to New Balance, how much say does sales, because you're in sales, mm -hmm. have over product? Uh, well, product would prefer if we stayed out of it completely. <laughs> but we, we can't as salespeople because we get real-time feedback. But no, at the, at the inception of, of product, you know, the briefing stage, that's all the product managers working with uh, designers and with developers on where they want to take the line. We get brought in a little bit later and we do have a say in certain things or we can give feedback on color and we can give feedback on pricing. Uh, oftentimes we, we do impact the price of a shoe. We can say something's just priced too high mm -hmm. for what we, we know is happening in the market and they can adjust the price. We don't have as much as we would like and we have more than the product team would like. But at the end of the day, I think a good organization respects each other's roles and, and uses it to strengthen the overall organization. So we actually have such a great relationship with the product team but I, I was joking earlier on, but you, you two, especially you, Connor, you probably see product before, before I do. Yeah, Danny, Danny yeah. Orr gets the product to us very early. We're testing it, we're yeah. trying it, and you know, it, it's exciting. But then I also know on the other end of things, you know, the athletes at New Balance are a big role very in involved. product development. And you know, very early on during the world championships, if you look closely at the feet, you might see a, a unique spike on Sydney's feet. Yeah. And I, I just know how important the athletes are on the New Balance, New Balance yeah, side they well. shape they shape so much and they give a lot of feedback and we bring them to the new lab that we have in Boston now and, and the testing is rigorous and it's very advanced. So I mean, the game has changed now, in, 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 especially in, in racing, because with, the, with what Nike did with carbon fiber, it's changed everything. So athletes need confidence now. They need, a, they need to know that it's, they're not just being told, hey, the shoe's as good. They need to prove it. Yeah. So they're in the lab, they're testing, and they, they know it. And boy, the stuff that the team has done has been excellent. And the World Championships last summer, one of the best track meets, the one in Eugene, not in Budapest, when, when Jake Whiteman won the 1500, it was such validation because I'd been talking to some people in the stands and they were saying like, oh, Jakob's gonna win this on his lips. And I was like, maybe he will, but you know, Jake's gonna do well. And they were talking about the spikes and they were saying, well, are the New Balance spikes is good. And I was like, oh, I believe they are. And the lab testing tells us they are. And then sure enough, Jake went and got the win. Yeah, How about uh, Jake, and, Jake and, and uh, Josh both being from the same club. Unbelievable. I was chatting with Jake doing an interview with Jake just uh, in London in September and it's like there's something in the water. It, it, the, Jakob Ingerbrigtsen must be going out of his mind to lose to two, two fellas two from, guys from, the, from the same running club, right, same age. Same town in Crazy. Scotland, right? Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. So there's something happening in Scotland. I mean, between them two and Laura Muir is unbelievable and Andy Burchard. I mean, they, there's a lot of fast runners coming, coming out of Scotland. But and I mean, some of that might be talent, but also just the culture I think of the, it's the area. Culture, yeah. yeah, because I mean, sure, Josh and, and and Jake are talented, right? But for two kids to come out of the same club and then win, win back to back world championships in fifteen hundred meters, it's crazy. It's crazy. When we're yeah. talking with more and more pro athletes, and you know, they're so in tune with their footwear now with these super shoes because they're making a difference. You know, ev every ounce you can get off a shoe, every responsiveness. Uh, percentage you can get can help you maybe win an Olymp or win a world championship medal. Yeah. And I think when we look back at your days as, you know, your first few years out of college as a pro, my guess is you weren't maybe looking at the shoes quite as closely. No, not at all. Not we we you were just happy to get shoes. You know, it was <laughs> it was very it was a very different day. I mean, 
the talent existed in, in those days yeah. all the way, you know, yeah. Joe, you said the talent has always been there. Yeah. But the, what we're seeing now in track times and in road times, it's a combination of all of the factors. It's the shoes, but beyond the shoes, it's the nutrition, it's the pre and post training, it's the, the strength and conditioning work, it's the nutrition. I mean, athletes are, it's a, it's a 360 degree, you know, they're, they're, they're a hub and they've spokes coming out of them with touching everything, you know? Do you find it hard now looking back like, ah, I didn't have those shoes, I didn't have that knowledge, or do you kind of just maybe look forward and... Yeah, I think in, I think if I was later and it kind of happened to me and I just missed it, I would have been, because I was pretty depressed when running stopped for me. I was just so frustrated. But now I'm, I'm, I'm happy because I'm where I am today. I've got a great relationship with all the runners I ran against. We're all friends. I love Providence College. You know, I'm married to someone I love who's the best and I met her through work. So all of these things happen that you never want to say you have regrets, right? Because the regrets might mean you, you wish something was different. But if you're asking me hypothetically, yeah. sure. Yeah. It would have been great to just get like five or six years post-college with no injuries. And, and the shoes would have made a difference. And the other, all the other pieces would have made a difference too. And with the pros right now, we, we talk about, you know, it's very, it's very important to hit the times, run well, but that's only one element. Back in the day, you know, if you got your Olympic gold, you were set with a, a, a contract and everyone was happy. But now there's social media elements. There's almost a presence of, you know, being a character and getting seen. Yeah. Um, how, what do you think about that? And I heard just through the grapevine, you might have had one of the first run blogs out there. I think, I think Tom McArdle, I don't know if you remember that name, but mm -hmm. Tom, I think, had the first run blog. Okay. And then I did have an early run blog. Yeah. I, I was blogging about music and running when I was doing that comeback in 2009. So it was yeah. 2008, and I was just posting my training, what I did, and what music I listened to. Yeah. Because at the time, it was, when, it was when the original iPods came out and the, you could run with music. Yeah. So it was awesome. And it was fun and it was engaging. And, it, it, you know, at that time, it had a lot of readers. So it was kind of like homework. I did one every day. So, uh, and it was almost a way you were building your own brand. It was, it was fun. And, and it was like a 2.0. And I was like not training super hard and, and was being sensible. But yeah, now with social media, it's a, it's a totally different world. Yeah. It's a totally different world. I still think you want to reward times first and foremost. But as a brand selling product, the role of, the, of an influencer beyond fast times is really important. And to use a non-running example, Taylor Swift wears a pair of New Balance 550s at a Chiefs game in the, because they were the colors of the Chiefs. The next day you can't find those shoes in any Foot Locker or Dick's Sporting Goods anywhere in America. Yeah. Because there was people going on StockX buying them. These were shoes that were not like a collab or anything. Yeah but they were for $500, $600 in StockX next day. So the influence of, of culture is, is massive and the athletes that can do both, that can run really fast and are just likable and have great personalities and seem very approachable, they're the ones that are, are the deservedly so getting paid and doing really well. And on the lifestyle side, how much does lifestyle and running kind of mix between our are there two totally different teams? Are they communicating with each other? They are communicating with each other. They're two totally different teams, except the person who oversees design oversees both performance and lifestyle, uh, Brad Lacey. So I think, you know, they, they have to be a little closer now as well because there is a sports style element. Mm. I mean, the original 860s are now a lifestyle shoe, you know? So there's, and then just, design language and, and uh, marketing language and brand language, like the fonts we use really come from lifestyle. And uh, so it does, it does bleed in. And then we're just seeing a shift in running now where on the, on the one hand you have the runner that is laser focused on qualifying for an Olympic trials or qualifying for an Olympic games. Then in the middle, you've got this kind of run culture group that want to qualify for Boston or, or just want to, you know, be part of a crew and, and, and look good and be healthy. And then you've got newbies over here. This group in the middle is as influential now, what we're seeing is as influential as the fast, fast people. 
So something that's really cool in their community that's maybe attached to a running store or not attached to a running store, they're just a club and they're showing up for runs and people are, you know, they're open, they're inclusive. Those groups are, are making a difference and that's where the culture aspect is coming in. Right. Music, art, running, yeah. all kind of blending together. Well, we saw Jack Harlow uh, in Boston right. rocking the 1080s. Yes, yes. That's his shoe. Uh, I, and he was on a treadmill. I don't know how much running he <laughs> actually does. Or did they force him onto a treadmill, but yeah. You know, there, but we did have some, we had some musicians run New York this year. Did you? Yeah, and uh, you know, it's, running's, yeah, it's, it, it's definitely becoming a bigger thing among the culture. For, for whatever reason, and maybe it's after the pandemic, but as long as the pinnacle is always is considered a sport, I'm, I'm a, I always push that like pro running is amazing. It's the sport, it's the best expression of what we do. The rest of it's all the, the fun stuff. And when we talk about some of those more lifestyle shoes, Joe and I actually have built our own, I, I think you did a nine. Seven, 74? Yeah. I think so. So we, we built them at New Balance Shoe School. Oh, you went to shoe school. Yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave Shelbourne. I have never done shoe school. So shoe school stopped at the pandemic and, and hasn't... Oh, they got to bring that back. Hasn't kicked back in, but I'm sure, I'm sure it'll come back. But I've, it was always one of those things where I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next yeah. one until I never went to one. So the, the, for those that don't know what shoe school is, it's Connor and I attended it. And you actually go to one of the last U.S. manufacturing plants of running shoes. And you go from start to finish, and the people that work at every single station, you go through and you do what they do, yeah. and you build a shoe. Now it's not nearly as good as what they do, but I still have that shoe. It's really cool. Oh, it's uh, incredible. Everyone that's done it says the experience is incredible, Joe. Right, and the, the you know just the energy, and uh, how appreciative those people are of their jobs, yeah. and what that plant does for their community. It's amazing, and there's and we just opened one in New Hampshire and broke ground on another one in New Hampshire last week yeah. in Londonderry. So, I mean, do it. The Davises are and maintaining their investment in domestic manufacturing. Yes. So, speaking of Jim Davis, uh, tell us your story about beer and Jim Davis. So, Jim Davis is the owner of New Balance. Yeah, Jim. Jim. Jim's the owner. And uh, his son, Chris, is now the CMO mm -hmm. and the, the SVP of merchandising. And Anne still is over HR. And, uh, and then Kasia is doing some of her own things on the side with PF Flyers and her own brand, Kata. And uh, yeah, they're such a great family. But Jim has always had a, a specific love for the, the independent kind of retailer. Uh, that's that's out there slinging shoes and uh so over the years he he enjoyed traveling with the with the running sales team and the yeah. running marketing team so we would go on trips with jim to visit stores and uh i'm a big beer snob <laughs> which i i don't know where that came from living in new england it just came from there and we were on one of the, one of the trips and i was with tom cardio and kevin adams and 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 jim and he has some coarse light on his plane so he's sharing at the Coors Light, and I declined, respectfully declined. I didn't want to drink one. I thought you said you don't drink that piss. I did say I don't, yeah. <laughs> I said I think, I think it's, it tastes like piss. Yes. So he put that in his bank until the next day when we were back going on the next leg of the trip, and the Coors Lights were broken out. And I respectfully declined, and Jim knew I was going to decline. And then he reached in, and he, he had, had someone go get some IPAs for me. And I think it was a mid, it was actually a San Luis Obispo, a brewery. I think it was Firestone. Yeah. That's down there, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. It was Firestone. Yeah. So not my favorite IPA in the world, no, but, but it was very solid. But better than, of course, like. And then next time we, next time we went uh, to, his, to his garage, we had, had, a, had a couple of beers and he had a Heady Topper in the back, which is a famous Vermont beer. And uh, he gave me the Heady Topper. And then I think Tom at that point was like, okay, I just want to make, set the record straight that I too like Heady Toppers and don't just drink Coors Light. Yeah. So yeah, and now Jim's always got a supply of uh, good ideas. I know, I've been to his, man, I've been to his man cave. And yeah. It's pretty interesting when like the 34th wealthiest guy in the planet is serving you. Joe, do you like Cheez-Its? Yeah, I like <laughs> Cheez-Its, Jim. Yeah. Do you like beer nuts? Yeah. And do you like a proper IPA? Yeah, thanks, That's Jim. Yeah. yeah. Very, it, very down to earth. Just a really nice guy. Family. Family. Really, yeah. really nice wonderful, guy. Wonderful people. And that's what makes New Balance special. Yeah. You know, it, it makes you grind a little bit harder when you see, you know, what CD does and his love for the company and 
how much they've given to the community and what they've built in Boston and built in Brighton. I mean, it's phenomenal. And, and you, you've been both been there. The, and it continues to expand and they continue to add to it. And it's essentially a sports hub for the Northeast between the, the Bruins and the Celtics and what's happening at the New Balance track. I mean, when you go to the track, there's, I don't think that there's another facility in America that is just how well it's built, how many like uh, different areas there are that it's just unlike any other track. Yeah. And I mean, it's a fun time. Yeah, it's like university type yeah. facilities, but it's, it's for the public. So it's, yeah, kids in high school are, are doing their dual meets there on a Tuesday night. You know, it's, it's incredible. And we've been talking a lot about how do we grow the sport. And I think that's one way um, to help develop it and bring excitement. And another common theme that we keep bringing up is rivalries in the sport. Have a time and a place where people come and you know that those two athletes are going to be there and there's going to be a face-off. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did you have a rival back in the day? Yeah, Ryan, Ryan Shea was, okay. was probably the biggest. And uh, it's, it's very sad. But yeah, and we didn't get on great. We weren't, we weren't friendly rivals. <laughs> Ryan was very intense. And, uh, and yeah, we, so we had our, our run-ins over the years. But we got, became friends after college. But yeah, he was, he was uh, great. And then when I was graduating, there was a, a kid coming through Georgetown named Franklin Sanchez, mm -hmm. who was all world. And, and, and he was a freshman and, and he came out of a Big East one year and he pushed Hamish and I all the way in. And he ended up finishing fifth at NCs that year. And then he just never really panned out for Franklin. He was American junior record holder. He broke Prefontaine's junior record holder wow. in the 5K, uh, 13, 36 maybe back in the day as a freshman and uh, yeah, I don't know where he is now. Was there ever any trash talking out there on the, on the course? Not really, no. Sometimes, the, sometimes they'd make fun of us for being, for, for, for the Irish accents and stuff, you know? <laughs> but uh, now we were all business. We were a bit ragtag at Providence as well. So the other teams seemed way more buttoned up than we were. Yeah. We always were kind of, we took it very seriously on when the gun went, but kind of pre and post, we were a very fun group. We had lads from, from Ireland, from New Zealand, from the UK, from Canada, and from America. And it was just a, a real melting pot team, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, we weren't the most supported squad compared to Georgetown and Nova, and at the time Syracuse and Notre Dame were all in the Big East. But yeah, we had a, we had a good time. <laughs> People wanted to be around us. And we, we keep talking about how dominant you were on the cross country course. What was the strategy come race day? Were you someone who would take it off and drop everyone? Yeah. 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 So, Is that how you beat Alan Webb? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, Alan Webb. Yeah, I just went straight from, from the gun. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was how kind of Ray liked us to run. Yeah. You know, NC's was different because of the conditions. But typically at Big East, I just knew that if I could run... Franklin Park was like a backyard to us, so I just knew what I could do. So I just knew what, where I needed to get to by mile one, mile two, and then if I was like low nine minutes, going through two miles, yeah. no one was going to was going to pass me. So that was how it was for that couple of years. It was awesome. It was a really, really fun, fun time. I want to thank you very much, um, very, very much. Yeah, this has been fun. This I mean, was I, great. I don't, yeah. I don't know if you have any insight into running shoes in the running industry in the next few years? Anything that stands out to you? No, not, not, not to me, uh, because I think it's becoming more homogenous now. Like every brand is doing good stuff. Yes. Yeah. So it was, there was a time even pre-pandemic, you know, where the, the landscape has changed between what, you know, Hulk has done and, and what On has brought to the table. And, and, you know, we're seeing brands downstairs big brands in the industry like Nike here at the running event, reinvesting in, in our world. Adidas is back downstairs, reinvesting in our world. And, you know, so br brands like the core legacy brands like, like New Balance and, and Brooks and Asics mm -hmm. and, and Saucony, where are the other brands that are all vying? There's no bad shoes anymore. I mean, we're all friends. We all want to see each other do well and we're all kind of morphing into the same product. So. It will take someone to do a very cool innovation. Yeah. And, and brands like Puma and stuff are doing cool stuff, but they're just not right there, there yet in terms mm. of the customer. So I don't know, but I trust, to speak for our team, I trust that you know, what Kevin Fitzpatrick knows is leading the product team with Danny Orr 
and 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 the group under under Danny and they're they're doing some really really cool yeah. stuff and pushing the envelope and the the shoes are comfortable and they fit well and they're just they've all the things that a runner would ever want whether you want to go fast whether you want something plush to go jogging in or whether you want something really fast on a race day the problem is that we have to find other solutions to get in front of runners and bring the brand front of mind to the runner because there is so many good shoes out there. Yeah, it's very competitive. Exactly. But I want to thank you again. Yeah. I know you're very busy. And no, but... this has been wonderful. And I want to thank you too for your support over the years. And uh, yeah, keep rocking. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And keep going with this podcast. I can't wait to, I can't wait to subscribe and yes. like and follow. That's it. Subscribe, like, and follow. So Do all those things. Yes. That's all what, we need. What yeah. I wanted to mention is... Uh, I'm going to probably lose it, but um, a good friend of mine, uh, Mike, Mike Finelli, passed away yesterday. Hmm. One of the best, biggest track fans and collectors of track stuff. And love the guy. I'm going to miss him. So sorry to end crying, but. No, it, the, the track world, the, the track world. Listen, we talked about this beforehand. I had read so much, and I, I was on some email chains with Mike because of just being on legacy email lists with yeah. everyone from Bill Rogers all the way across. And uh, he was so highly respected in, in, in running and a fan of the sport. And like I keep referencing this, we have to remind ourselves that this is a real sport with amazing, amazing athletes, and, and he was a, a shining, and some a great shining supporter. Yeah, great people, yeah. Right, so I took him on. Uh, he was part of our group for the Olympic trials for 20-some-odd years, and just yeah. a really good human being, so. Yeah, he'll be missed, spe yep. especially next summer when we're, when we're all back at Eugene. Eugene, the Olympic exactly. Trials. Yep. So rest in peace, so thank you, everyone.